My name is Ann Hilton, and I'm uh, fortunate to moderate this excellent talk today. We have two speakers that I'll introduce in a minute, and they're going to provide an update of the very recent Banff meeting. Um, I'll begin by acknowledging that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory, and we respect the histories, language, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. I also want to thank Paladin for their support of this ATI seminar series. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speakers and I'll just also uh, add they're going to be discussing um, multiple different organ groups um, uh, as individual sections. So we'll have a question and answer at the end, but if you have questions as we go for these individual different groups, please put them in the chat as we go so that we can uh, hopefully get to all of your questions by the end, um, but they will be discussed as an organ group. Uh, so um, our speakers today have very long and uh, a very um, uh, beautiful bios, so I will just kind of summarize them. Um, Dr. Michael Mangle is the Chair and Medical Director for Laboratory Medicine Pathology at the University of Alberta and with Alberta Precision Laboratories here in Edmonton. Um, he's studied medicine in, um, in Budapest and he has gone on to specialize in transplant pathology uh, and nephropathology. And he was at the Hanover Medical School before joining us here in Edmonton. Um, he's engaged in various international subspecialty societies related to this work and he's published vastly in this field. Um, and so his current work is focused on applying medical techniques and to biopsy, uh, molecular techniques to biopsy specimens uh, to increase diagnostic precision and transplantation. And Dr. Ben Adam is an anatomic pathologist and associate professor here at the University of Alberta in Edmonton also. He is a site chief for the laboratory medicine and divisional director of anatomic pathology at the University of Alberta Hospital. His medical um, school and residency were here at the University of Alberta and he trained at in Massachusetts General Hospital as well in renal pathology as well as Toronto General Hospital um, before uh, and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center before coming back to join us here with all of this excellent new knowledge and his research is focused on molecular transplantation pathology and use of gene expression technologies as um, uh, with some overlap obviously between these two speakers. So uh, without further ado I will let uh, I think you're beginning uh, Dr. Mingle uh, talk to us about an update on allograft pathology and transplant diagnostics. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the um, support by the Alberta Transplant Institute and its sponsors. Mm -hmm for giving Ben and I the um, opportunity to share with you a summary of the 2022 Banff meeting. And with that, giving you an update where the field stands for allograft pathology and uh, transplant diagnostics. So here are my disclosures. And our learning objectives are to review the current status in allograft pathology and to understand the diagnostic gaps and clinical challenges in the Banff classification and this across organs, um, and to discuss further directions for updating the band classification uh, and to address these gaps. So there, the BANF meeting was in 2022, one year postponed from 2021. It usually happens every two years on odd years. And the first meeting was actually in BANF in 1991. And in this building, what you can see at the um, bottom right, which is at the Banff Center for Fine Arts, where in 1991, a small group of 11 pathologists, clinicians, and surgeons met and uh, set the foundation for the Banff kidney allograft pathology classification, which was then consecutively uh, published in 1993 in Kidney International. And actually, here is the very first abstract um, where the classification was applied. Um, and presented the results by Kim Solis at the um, United States Canadian Academy of Pathology. And for those younger than uh, some of us, this is how you submitted an abstract in the past to, uh, to a meeting. You had to type it into a preformed form and it could not exceed this box. You had to hand sign it and type in all the information and then you faxed it over when you were lucky enough to have a fax machine. Otherwise you mailed it in. Um, much has changed since 30 years. The classification has come a long way. And the process, how it came through this, these three decades of evolution is that there is a community of subject matter experts from various disciplines. There is no restriction what your background is, as long as you're affiliated with the field of organ transplantation and have an interest in um, 
uh, transplant diagnostics and I'll graph pathology. And every two years, the ban International Banff meeting is convened where the centerpiece of what is the biopsy-based lesions, which can be histologically and nowadays also molecularly, are reviewed and discussed and how these lesions translate into diagnoses, usually using um, thresholds derived from clinical correlations with function outcome or response to treatment of um, the allograft. And this is, as you can see, based on consensus and associations. Unfortunately, there in transplantation, there is no just black and white diagnostic marker telling you whether you have rejection because we are dealing with a continuous immune response. And there are gaps and flaws naturally in this process. And that's why with the classification, new data are generated. And then this is a feedback loop informing how it can be further improved. And this has been ongoing for for 30 years now and uh, fairly successful because the band system, as you can say, or the classification had a significant impact on the field. And for example, in kidney, the um, major landmark clinical trials for approval of new drugs. And with that, the endpoint of biopsy proven rejection has been facilitated for generating the consensus through the band process. Um, the, the literature impact is significant. It's the band from uh, classification uh, reports are amongst the most cited um, articles in our field. Despite all the limitations it has, it is more about the process attached to it, how we can further improve allograft diagnostics, in particular related to biopsies. So this is, this is a high level overview of the 2022 meeting, which was held and organized in conjunction with our partner society, the Canadian Society of Transplantation. And in celebration, as I said, of the 30 year anniversary of the classification, we went back to Banff and had a very successful joint meeting uh, throughout the week of September 19th, which started with a full day Banff pre-meeting symposium revisiting the classification over the last three decades and having an outlook where it is supposed to go. And then, as you can see, there are in the morning parallel sessions or joint symposia in the early morning and then plenary joint sessions on Wednesday and Thursday between CST and Banff around common topics across organ systems. And then in the afternoon, uh, the two societies and subspecialty groups which are organ specifically organized uh, break out into their concurrent sessions, which are mainly working sessions and not necessarily just a presentation of recent research, but rather a discussion of the clinical relevant problems. And of course, there are also the best social events in the evening uh, of this uh, conference. So this is a, a slide attempting to summarize the outcome of the Banff conference across the organs. You see on the left, uh, the first column are the different organs. And then when you go over the columns to, to the right, those are the main topics which were discussed at the meeting. There are classification updates where gaps in, in the existing classifications were identified in the working group meetings for the organs. And, and there are usually collaborative efforts internationally through working groups addressing those through collaborative trials and studies and data analysis, which leads to updates of the classification. Then there is a cross-sectional theme, how to integrate molecular diagnostics uh, into the classification and the biopsy workup. And uh, this is work ongoing for now more than 10 years as part of the BANF process. A new um, area which is opening up across all organs is minimal invasive surveillance. Uh, when to do what minimal invasive test in what patient? Um, is it an adjunct diagnostic? Is it a screening test triggering a biopsy? So learning <clears throat> how to use minimal invasive tests, which includes, of course, DSA, and, um, but also the recently rapidly unfolding insights into using donor-derived cell-free DNA as a injury marker to the graft in a highly specific and sensitive manner related to injury in the graft, not necessarily diagnostic, but all the organ systems discussed how it could be an additional tool in uh, enhancing diagnostic sensitivity and precision in the various organ settings. And then the other major big theme 
uh, with a lot of presentations um, uh, is the emerging use of artificial intelligence as adjunct decision support tools in transplantation and in transplant diagnostics. So for example, for one, and I will go through this in detail, is of course the iBox as a risk prediction tool and a potential surrogate endpoint in clinical trials as recently proposed by regulatory bodies as a, a recognized secondary endpoint for now, but with the potential to become even a prim primary endpoint. And uh, tools like image analysis for biopsy slides or automated risk and activity and chronicity calculators based on band lesion scores or even automated reporting systems, which can be connected with uh, image analysis uh, tools. And then the last major theme, of course, no cotton transplant conference these days without having a session on xenotransplantation. But of course, the angle of the Banff conference was um, focused on how do we essentially learn how to diagnose the relevant pathology and grade and classify the relevant pathology in biopsies coming from xenografts. And as you can imagine, there is a handful of xenografts um, now available, and with that, only a handful of, of biopsy specimens. The initial findings from these biopsy specimens were reviewed at the conference, and, and strategies were discussed how essentially a Banff xenotransplant classification can emerge over time. So this is a 50,000 foot um, a review or overview and summary of the, the Banff meeting one week. Uh, I think over a hundred speakers and, and not speakers presentations, uh, full day programs every day from seven to uh, 6 p.m. And um, I will now dive into some details and highlights organ by organ. And as Anne said is please type your questions because I do not assume that all of you are interested in every organ system. And um, instead of just getting through the kidney and digressing there and dominating everything, we would like to give everybody an opportunity to answer questions related to every specific organ. And I will go through kidney, liver, and pancreas, and then Ben will follow with heart, lung, and uh, vascularized, uh, vascularized composite allografts. Okay, so the kidney session was run and organized and overseen by Candice Rufus from the Imperial College in London and Martin Nasons from Leuven in, in Belgium. And I really would like to express my gratitude to them for sharing their summary slides and notes with me in preparation for this, this presentation. Okay, so reminder, what is the Banff classification for? So it is for the individual patient management and clinical trials as endpoint, it is not primarily a prognostic tool. It is a diagnostic classification, but its value need to dem be demonstrated that it benefits the patient when you act on the diagnosis. So therefore it has an association with prognosis, but it is not primarily a prognostic tool. It should be usable in daily practice. So it needs to be, um, reasonably simple and at ovary complex, which is a challenge. And where we can, it should link directly to mechanisms and, and pathophysiology and the respective targeted treatment mechanisms, which is also not always the case. So the, the meeting discussion started for kidney. This is the current footnote list of the kidney band classification. And somebody in the audience said, this is a visceral assault, which yeah, I think has a has some ground to stand on, but what, what studies and surveys and research has shown is the complexity of the band classification causes errors in classifying cases, contradicting at times itself between band versions. So it became almost over 30 years a, a very complex system which can almost not be handled by a human being. And there were then, as I allude later, uh, presentations where artificial intelligence was programmed to use the band classification and actually discovered the contradictions in the rules itself, which need to be addressed. And uh, this summarizes that over time, there were many, many, many changes and adjustments in reaction to flaws in the classification, but it is so often that probably people just gave up to follow it. And 
And I don't even know what version of an iPhone or, or operating system I have anymore because they are just updating all the time. And uh, there is a very good paper by Martin Nason's group summarizing this for antibody mediated rejection, what the different versions of the band classification are evolving over uh, two decades actually mean in terms of um, outcome and prognosis. He was able to um, essentially in his database program cases and assign the various band versions of antibody mediated rejection and see how that links to, to outcome and prognosis, and which is not um, straightforward to interpret because do you want the classification which is most prognostic or most diagnostic accurate? And that was a major discussion at the meeting and to address this. And one major important contentious point is a major feature of the band classification to diagnose antibody-mediated rejection is microvascular inflammation with MVI, which is glomerulitis and peritubular capillaritis in the kidney, but also a major key pathology in all other organs in the setting of antibody-mediated rejection. So can we take microvascular inflammation automatically equaling antibody-mediated rejection and treat it as such or not? And as some of you may be aware, there is more and more literature emerging recently that you can see microvascular inflammation in various settings with or without um, donor-specific anti-HLA antibodies, non-HLA antibodies, no antibody itself, or even in the setting of severe DGF or early ischemia reperfusion injury. And what is clear is that antibody-mediated rejection is a spectrum, a continuum from from early stage lesions, chronic smoldering, subclinical lesions to chronic active lesions and a chronic end stage. And depending on when in this continuum you do a biopsy, you see different pathology of the same disease. But the complexity results from the fact that each of these pathology lesions you see at different times can also be observed in different settings. For example, recurring glomerulonephritis can also have a, a capillary inflammatory cells like antibody-mediated rejection in the setting of glomerulitis or interstitial fibrosis and tubal atrophy can be seen in, in any chronic disease or glomerular double contours can be seen in thrombotic microangiopathy or recurrent glomerulonephritis. So the challenge really lies in that certain lesions are more common, more often associated with antibody-mediated rejection, but not automatically af absolutely diagnostic and pathognomic. And trying to reflect this in the classification represents a major challenge and leads knowingly to confusion how to clinically manage these patients. So the proposal which was um, emerging at the classification, at the BANF meeting was really about saying the key feature we see is microvascular inflammation. And um, we can also have DSA only and no pathology. That's the green at the bottom. But then we, as some of these patients with microvascular inflammation uh, are DSA positive. And that is fairly reasonably accurately uh, translating into the diagnosis of antibody-mediated rejection. But there is half of the patients, around 50 to 60%, which have microvascular inflammation, but no anti-HLA donor-specific antibody at the time. And this group can break down into various different um, associations with potential underlying causes, like severe ischemic injury, like recurrent disease, like um, microvascular inflammation in the setting of missing self, or non-HLA antibodies, or an anti-HLA antibody, which is not detected by standard methods. And uh, C4D, unfortunately, is not always positive in any of these cases, and therefore can only help when it's positive in the context of DSA. We still don't know, we assume, whether non-HLA DSA can also cause C4D positivity. Unlikely, but possible. So therefore, C4D is not the ideal marker as well. So then what is the approach to resolving this? And it can only be it, almost like a decision tree, multi-prong approach, because there's no absolute specificity in any of these measurements, neither DSA 
anti-HLA or non-HLA DSA. Um, missing self can be coinciding with anti-HLA DSA, for example. Molecular tests are sensitive, but probably as specific as microvascular inflammation is, because when you have microvascular inflammation, associated transcripts in the microcirculation, most of them, or you don't know whether all, but some might carry less specificity, others might carry more specificity. For example, endothelial transcript might be less specific than NK cell associated transcripts, but we don't know how those relate for a situation like missing self either. So the, the, the strategy is to take these building blocks of diagnostics and reassemble essentially how they best characterize the various iterations of these lesions and combinations. And um, I'm not sure whether what I just told you created more confusion or clarity. We will see what questions come up related to that. The other big area is um, managing late biopsies with chronic active lesions. You know, the, the category of chronic active T-cell mediated rejection was introduced and there is still confusion around how this is clinically used. It is heavily um, relying on um, the presence of inflammation in areas of interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy, IIFTA, which in itself is not absolute as specific either. But if you have a history of uh, T-cell mediated rejection, no other lesions, it fits into that context of, as studies from sequential biopsies have uh, shown. However, since its introduction, it has been identified that the pure category of chronic active T-cell mediated rejection rarely occurs in isolation, and that treatment attempts of this um, uh, have mixed results. Some patients responded and got better, some not. The sample size is very small. There's only one study published in Kidney International, and uh, the question really is how do we design better trials in this space to see the or prove the clinical relevance of this? And, and there are some efforts on better structuring um, the categorization of chronic active T-cell mediated rejection, clarification around how to score tubulitis and inflammation in this setting, but also how to integrate molecular tools uh, into randomization for clinical trials in treating chronic active inflammation in the setting of T cell mediated rejection or the other way around in the absence of any other concomitant cause um, being associated with IFTR like BK, ABMR, or recurrent diseases. Okay, where is the future? Uh, the other big topic um, of the, the two next over columns of the BAMF classification. Of course, molecular BAMF process is continuing. There are efforts in how we can further validate molecular tools, how they fit into the clinical context of use. Like I showed you two examples, one around um, better classifying patients with microcirculation inflammation for activity, risk stratification, and diagnostics, and similarly those with uh, um, inflammation in IFTA. And uh, there are efforts underway around with the available molecular commercial tests, um, like the molecular microscope, which is uh, doing multi-center studies and the consortium around the BHOT panel where a, a online database and tool is available to upload cases and see how they perform in the context of a larger cohort. And there was discussion which areas require validation and, and um, standardization around methods, cutoffs, values. So if you have, like we know all in, in lab diagnostics, you can have a Siemens analyzer and a Roche analyzer, both can do creatinines, but at the end, we come up with values which can be compared and harmonized. Same for troponin. So similar efforts are required around molecular measurements in the tissue, which has been done in transplant around uh, viral load, for example, in effect transplant ID testing. And, um, and still the so what question remains for, for all these ancillary diagnostic tools is so, so what what are we doing? And as we teach all our residents is don't order a lab test when you do not, do, do not know what to do with the result. Because when you have a result and you don't know what to do, it might cause patient harm, um, especially when the result is over-optimistic or makes unreasonable claims, um, like some tests in, in cancer might do and, and, and creating false hopes to patients. And um, 
we really need to better define the clinical context of use of ancillary tools, which is not only tissue-based diagnostics, but also serum-based diagnostics, especially around standardization of non-HLA antibody testing and selfie-derived donor uh, DNA, donor-derived selfie DNA, it's the other way around. So then there was a, was a big session on decision support tools. This slide is a courtesy by Alex Lupi summarizing the journey of the iBox, which is a logistic regression tool allowing to, at any point in time, predict the five-year and three-year risk or even seven-year risk of allograft failure based on clinical and pathology variables and laboratory variables. And uh, some of you may have seen this, uh, this um, approach recently received um, approval by the EMA, the European Medical Association, Medical Device Association, um, being qualified as a secondary endpoint for clinical trials. So this has been a very long journal and collaborative effort by big societies, uh, numerous centers validating this tool. And uh, I think it, it really, really highlights or, or become is, is a milestone in how management of patients will change over the next decade using such decision support tools, which can be integrated with our electronic health records, pull the data from the electronic health record and provide you with relevant clinical information and potentially in the future guide treatment decisions. And, and we in lab use tools, not that comprehensive, but similar, for example, in uh, newborn risk prediction for prenatal screening, similar, similar approach where, where a sample is done and informs decision about how to manage potential risk pregnancies. So, so it exists, but I think it gets a complete different impact and power when you link it with electronic health, comprehensive electronic health records, as we could do here in Alberta. And um, similar approaches now and, and great progress made on how to do use digital pathology. So uh, digital images of, of whole pathology slides and using um, convoluted neuronal networks to, to score fundamental pathology lesions like interstitial fibrosis, tubulitis, number of globally sclerosed glomeruli, intimal fibrosis of arteries, which then give continuous, reproducible, and accurate um, quantitative numbers, which can feed then further into um, other decision support tools like um, chronicity calculators or activity calculators in the setting of a biopsy. Similar approaches have been done in cancer, like measuring for proliferation activity with by key 67 and informing risk prediction of breast cancer. And uh, this field really has made major progress and just recently received a, an investment of 80 million euros in, in Europe to develop new technologies and tools uh, in this area of digital image analysis and health. And uh, another component of this is, as I said, the band classification is very, very complex, has many, many rules. And there are now scoring tools where you just enter the score. And maybe in the future, the scores are entered by image analysis tools. And the program is as trained on all the algorithms and rules BANF has and proposes to you the diagnosis as per BANF rules. And there have been uh, it has been an interesting paper recently in AJT by Martin Nason's group is where you take a tool like this and add to it intuition, soft intuition by a clinician looking at the chart and then combining that in a risk prediction model by um, machine learning, which actually superseded any uh, standard of care approaches in risk stratifying patients. And then briefly, xenotransplantation, as I mentioned, um, every biopsy reviewed from the recent cases has been presented at that BANF meeting, and there is a small group of pathologists um, which are discussing what are the key pathology lesions, and the pathology seems to be slightly different um, <clears throat> or even fundamentally different from what we see in humans or with human donors. And there were also interesting data presented with a BPOT panel, so a molecular gene panel, um, which has the human um, uh, template, but the PIC homolog for doing molecular studies in these xenopic grafts to see whether the knocked out or knocked down 
pathways are actually not after upregulated for alternative pathways uh, after transplantation and which are the main molecular pathways during rejection. So this is for sure uh, uh, an evolving and again, a field coming up to more attention by the recent um, advances in transplanting the first um, modified um, PIC organs to humans. So that was a summary of what was going on or what the current status at the kidney is. If priests just put all their questions into, into the chat box, we will come back to that. I will briefly now give an overview of what the liver group did is, here's a list of all the presenters who kindly shared their slides with me uh, to help put this together. And uh, there is a working group going on that some of you working in the liver know is steatohepatitis and the donor is used by some centers to accept or reject organs and there is confusion around how to score it. The scoring is not very reproducible. So there is an international effort to standardize the scoring and even train image analysis and morphometric decision support tools to give a better performance of uh, scoring steatohepatitis and steatosis in donors um, and making informed evidence-based decisions for accepting or rejecting an organ. So the first round, first two rounds of this effort have been completed, but it will continue until the next meeting. Then a major focus really on the whole liver sessions was with now, so there were two drastic changes in, in liver transplantation, except that the donor pool got bigger for, for numerous reasons, but also that with effective immunosuppression, there was always a concern to over immunosuppress because the liver rejects less. But secondly, now with effective anti-hepatitis C drugs is the whole recurrence of hepatitis C has been taken out of the pathology picture, which was a major differential diagnostic challenge in histopathology. And with that, grafts live longer, but also present with other pathology in late biopsies taken 10, 20, 30 years post-transplantation. And this was a major topic of discussing these pathologies which really haven't had yet much attention or were not in the center of attention because the grafts just didn't function that long. And um, there is a lack of a consistency how these findings are reported because there's no consensus classification. Um, it applies both to the inflammatory lesions coming back and the fibrotic lesions. Various native liver scoring systems are then redeployed to transplant without really having been validated. And uh, of course, when a graft is stable 25, 30 years after transplantation, who would do biopsies regularly? So there's not a lot of biopsies available. As I mentioned, hepatitis C has been, recurrence has been taken out of the equation. And uh, C4D now with late grafts and more DSA data are emerging in, in liver needs to be revisited what the relevant C4D staining pattern in liver is. And um, there is a broad spectrum of now, what is the difference? And that's an interesting question of a recurring autoimmune response to a liver, like autoimmune hepatitis in a native liver, but that in an allograft setting is kind of rejection. And it can be very subtle and subclinical. And in that context, when uh, donor-specific antibodies or outer antibodies are there, they can enhance this inflammation. And this inflammation persistent over time causes fibrotic remodeling. We know that. And then the question is, what is the best intervention in that? And um, so there were numerous presentations at looking at basic signs and in imaging in the graft and um, uh, digital spatial profiling of what the molecular immunological mechanisms are underlying this subtle chronic inflammation and resulting fibrosis. And one presentation brought, I like this slide, liver transplantation without protocol biopsy is a blind flight. Uh, it alludes to the fact that the clinical parameters measured are often very, very stable a long time with, that, with this ongoing inflammation, and that imaging technologies are not validated for liver transplants to the same extent as they are in inflammatory liver, native liver diseases. And um, there was a broad discussion about how biopsies when and, and for how long uh, can be used to guide immunosuppression because it seems in the liver that some patients are over immunosuppressed with a lot of side effects when you have a graft for decades 
which are obvious. And then, of course, there's another um, cohort which requires more immune suppression because they are at risk of developing DSA and these recurring smoldering immune responses and inflammation. So the big major central question is, and there was discussion around how to design trials informing what tools are applied when to identify those patients with, uh, who require more intense immunosuppression, those less intense immunosuppression. And there was a review by Annette Jackson around DSA testing, when, how, uh, what, which in the liver has less uh, data and experience compared to the kidney, for example. And of course, cell-free DNA, uh, a big topic. Can this give a better idea of liver injury? Because some of the liver function tests we do in clinical chemistry are either not specific or um, not sensitive or overly sensitive. So when you had one, when you were at the Oilers game, like I was last night and I had to drink too many beers because they played bad, then all my, my AST is just done probably coming up and um, and therefore, the, the search for better um, minimal invasive test is a significant focus in liver as well. Uh, there was a presentation about liver stiffness and, and fibro scan, but as I mentioned, they are not really very well um, validated and correlated with biopsy findings and outcome in the transplant setting and more work needs to, do, to be done. And the conclusion was a protocol liver biopsy is always better to have than just imaging surveillance. So uh, Jackie O'Leary, who was taking over the liver team and leading it with Chris Bellamy from, from Jake Demetrius, um, is, is, is trying to put it together and, and they are developing a roadmap around this problem. How after now the major game changer taking hepatitis C recurrence out of the picture um, how uh, how the monitoring and management of liver long term liver transplant allograft survivors um, uh, needs to be implemented in the clinic, and that is my understanding is this group will come up with some collaborative international studies and study protocols, but also some amendments to the classification about um, scoring this late inflammation. So briefly, the pancreas session. Um, which was presented and summarized by Cynthia Drachenberg. And just to highlight is the first pancreas session was in 1995 and published here, you can see down there in 1997. And, uh, and since then there has been introductions of chronic rejection and antibody mediated rejection guidelines for pancreas transplants. And um, the, the, there were now, so just to give you a dimension, so some centers do a thousand kidney transplant biopsies a year, but over, over more than a decade, there were a review of a thousand pancreas transplant biopsies. So transplant biopsies in pancreas are, are way, way less often and, and not as frequent. And, and there is a search for an alternative approach because they carry a greater risk than a liver or a kidney biopsy is to have surrogate biopsies, for example, from endoscopy at the, at the adjacent duodenal mucosa, which is transplanted as a cuff. Uh, but there were larger studies done over the last couple of years. The result is um, somewhat sobering that the protocol duodenal graft biopsy do not seem to be a reliable surrogate marker alone for pancreatic rejection. However, the biopsies can achieve good correlation with pancreas biopsies in case of dysfunction. So again, in case of dysfunction, higher pretest probability, of course, then you find a better correlation with the pathology in, in the allograft uh, itself, the pancreas. Again, also cell-free DNA is same question. How can it help us guide biopsies, identify those um, more sensitive with injury to the allograft and um, how specific um, is, is this obviously very sensitive test? And their first data emerging for a molecular blood-based testing of pancreas and also um, of the biopsy. And again, Similar to what we have doing in other organs, the applet mismatching molecular risk prediction and the novel DSA formation, it's well understood that uh, donor-specific antibodies play a significant role in chronic uh, pancreas rejection and sensitization. And imaging technologies are also a topic ongoing so to guide and trigger biopsies, and especially CT and PET scans are under investigation. 
there was an interesting presentation around that um, historically a, a lot of early graft failures after pancreas transplantation were labeled as, as uh, technical failures. But as this study from London turns out that um, many of those within the first year actually um, might not just be a technical failure, but have early immune responses, likely memory responses associated with DSA causing early rejection. Okay, so that was my uh, part of this. Um, and uh, we're handing over to Ben for the other three organs. And please really submit your, your questions in the chat box that we can um, um, answer those. Okay, thanks, Michael. Uh, so I want to leave some time for, hopefully everyone can see my, my screen. I wanna leave some time for questions. So I'll, I'll try to go through uh, these last three organs really quickly. It will be a bit of a whirlwind, but yeah, I'll try to get through them in the next 10 minutes or so, so that we have time for discussion after. Okay, so this is my one disclosure, not related to this talk, but for the sake of completion. Um, so I'll start with the heart summary. This is provided by Dylan Miller. Um, so these are the, the three main topics that were focused on during the heart session, digital pathology and artificial intelligence, non-HLA antibodies, and uh, the concept of mixed rejection. So uh, with regards to digital pathology and AI, um, so this was some data presented from uh, by Carolyn Glass from Duke on her work with AI for um, the diagnosis using AI with digital pathology uh, to diagnose acute cellular rejection and heart um, transplant biopsies. And um, similar to what other authors have shown, I think, in, in their uh, work is that uh, we are very good or we are able to achieve quite good um, diagnostic performance with these uh, algorithms um, within the, the training cohorts. But um, the, the challenge seems to be extending this to validation on, on additional, um, on new data uh, because of the issues we have in pathology with um, variation in staining quality, for example, uh, staining quality and characteristics between um, different centers and different slides, even at the same institution from day to day. So uh, I think we're, we're building a good experience with this um, machine learning technology, but <clears throat> haven't been able to validate it to the point that we'll, we will be able to use it clinically um, in the near future, I don't think, but hopefully one day we can um, have this additional tool available to us. Um, so this is an example of the diagnostic performance for identifying lower grade and higher grade rejection in these heart transplant biopsies, and just another potential application for AI um, assisting uh, pathologists in identifying uh, and quantifying the, the number of macrophages within uh, capillaries in, in these heart transplant biopsies. So beyond just diagnosing, yeah, assigning specific diagnostic categories, also assisting with the identification and quantification of specific features. Um, Elaine Reed re led a, a really interesting discussion on non-HLA antibodies. Um, so I, I won't go into the details. Michael touched on this as well, um, but this is also obviously an issue in the other organs, including the heart. Um, they have developed a, um, an assay at UCLA um, that is under patent that um, that seems to work quite well, but uh, as far as I know, hasn't been extended beyond their institution at this point for um, uh, the identification of non-HLA antigens. Um, but as as she did discuss, there are still several issues I think with with um, measuring these particular antigens. Um, so yeah, although they seem to have a pretty good assay in their hands. Um, I think, yeah, we have a ways to go before um, we know exactly how to measure and, and what to do with um, this particular uh, type of testing. Um, and then a discussion around the concept of mixed acute cellular and antibody media rejection in the heart and um, what the actual underlying pathophysiology of this entity is, whether it's AMR following ACR or whether it's all related to a single uh, pathophysiological process that we don't completely understand yet, um, but just looking at some of the data from, from some of our larger centers around the world, um, it does 
mixed rejection does make up a fairly significant um, proportion of, um, of the rejection cases that we do see, uh, similar in incidence to pure AMR and with a similar um, clinical outcome. So it's obviously a, a clinically significant category of um, histologic injury that we're seeing, um, but I, I think there's still a lot to be learned about exactly what it represents. Uh, jumping into the lung, uh, so these were the three main topics that were discussed, non-rejection pathology, um, again, new technologies, including molecular diagnostics and artificial intelligence, and then some uh, projects that we're working on as a group. So uh, this is just a slide showing some representative examples of the histology of acute and organizing lung injury. Um, uh, and uh, Elizabeth Pavlisko from Duke um, summarize some of the findings from this recent study, uh, which attempted to characterize um, the, these histologic patterns of injury in lung transplants. Um, but the, the issues that, uh, that we know of are that the, these, although um, this histologic pattern is associated with poor clinical outcome, it can be related to um, alloimmune uh, phenomena as well as, um, uh, as well as several other possible causes, including infection. Um, so um, yeah, the, we, we know that it's bad, but um, still need better tools, I think, to, to know exactly what's causing it when we're trying to assess these patients in real time in the clinic. Um, Carolyn Glass gave another update on her experience with machine learning lung transplantation, but um, this is still very early on, I would say, in the lung transplant field, but probably mostly because um, Lung transplant pathology is, is, I would argue, the most difficult to look at and um, is affected by a lot more artifactual changes on histology. So um, trying to apply these machine, machine learning and AI technologies to lung transplant biopsies um, is proving to be quite a bit more challenging. Um, so that's a summary of her discussion, uh, essentially. Um, AI has also been applied to uh, diagnostic imaging for lung transplants. So some data presented from Stein Verleden um, with uh, regards to his work using CT images um, and um, yeah, applying different features to subcategorize the prognostic um, uh, implications of those features for patients. Um, yeah. Then uh, we discussed uh, molecular techniques, which um, in the lung, because we have a, we have um, access to additional cytology samples in the form of bronchial brushings and bronchial bronchial alveolar lavage samples, um, there's a fairly broad spectrum of sample types as well as um, technologies that we're able to use. Um, so there's a lot of uh, really interesting work being done in this area with with essentially every combination that you can see on the slide. Um, so we attempted to go over some of the recent updates um, in this area. Uh, I did my best to summarize the great work that Phil and Kieran have been doing with the molecular microscope, um, including uh, these last couple studies. Um, this one from 2020, uh, showing that their molecular TCMR signatures were associated with graft loss, um, whereas histology and DSA were not, just as, a, an, as an example. And then this most recent study of theirs um, looking at chronic lung allograft dysfunction and um, uh, encouraging um, areas under the receiver operating curves um, with regards to uh, identification of this process um, with time correction. Uh, and then I presented some of our early data doing um, similar type of work with nanostring, um, which uh, we're currently expanding um, with some collaborators around the world. And then uh, John Greenland from San Francisco presented some of his work um, combining RNA-seq for transcript, um, for yeah, more discovery type analysis and then application in, um, in clinical cohorts using nanostring. Um, and so he's specifically focusing on inflammation within small airways, which he's referring to as this uh, novel E-grade rejection. Um, and then also donor-derived cell-free DNA is obviously being used in, in lung transplant patients as well. So Debbie Levine gave us a nice summary of um, some of her local experience with that, but similar to the other organs, what we're finding, and maybe even more so in lung because of the, the significance of infection in the differential diagnosis. Um, this does seem to be mostly a, a, a surrogate measure of injury and not necessarily rejection. So not very specific. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, some updates. This is a, a project 
that we're working on uh, to try to um, do a more comprehensive molecular characterization of antibody meter rejection in the lungs to see if that can help guide um, improvements in our histologic assessment of this entity because we don't have a very good um, all the features that we're currently using are very nonspecific, unfortunately. And then uh, Fiorella Calabrese from Italy gave an update on this um, research template that we've developed as a group um, to try to standardize the terminology that we're using in our assessment of the histology of lung transplant biopsies for both research and eventually clinical purposes. Okay, moving into the vascularized composite allograph session. Uh, this is the the session I think that always has the most interesting gross photographs. For, so for those of you that don't appreciate histology maybe as much as I do, this is a good one. I didn't include all of the photos of the like phallus transplantation, but I'm sure you can look those up if you like. Um, but uh, yes, some of the representative uh, case studies that were presented um, include uh, tracheal transplantation, um, a growing experience with uterus transplantation and the, the histology scoring systems that have been developed to grade rejection in these, these allografts. Um, and then a, a, a good discussion on the vascular changes that are specifically seen within these allografts, um, which has led to um, some updates, proposed updates to the, the, the current um, or the most recent 2007 classification for um, for the histologic assessment of these allografts, um, focusing, yeah, this is just summarizing the, the, the process that they've gone through to get to this point, but um, these are the specific updates that have, um, that they're working on, uh, focusing specifically on vascular changes um, within these allografts. And first of all, congratulations to these uh, two people who undertook this incredible uh, task of summarizing um, uh, um, an, an enormous amount of work uh, and, and doing it actually quite fairly. But I guess uh, as uh, someone who's been part of the BAMP from the beginning, uh, we, what we now see is, is complexity, complexity that we hadn't anticipated. And the process of, uh, of, of a consensus meeting, well, this is not a consensus meeting, but it's a, the BAMP process probably has reached the point where it cannot resolve um, the questions uh, in a in a way uh, in the way which we used to resolve them, where you could reach an answer and then set that forth and then have it tested, etc. The complexity has now exceeded our ability to resolve things within our field. So I, I see the BAMP now as a as a chance. Probably it's the best chance we have anywhere of getting a window on where our field is. But um, it may have exceeded its ability to resolve individual questions satisfactorily. Is that a fair assessment, Michael and Ben, or am I missing the point? Yeah, no, no, no. I think you nailed it, right? That came out of this meeting. So we need a different approach. Um, and Banff, at best, can be a custodian of the outcome of different approaches to have a better evidence-based generation of diagnostic tools, right? So we can't, we can't, I made the proposal saying we reduce the MANF meeting that I meet with myself and make the classification and generate consensus. But um, that there was not a lot of support, right? Of having an N equal one consensus meeting. So so we're, we're, we'll try to be more engaging for feedback on the classification with, with online consulting tools and things like this. But I think what you, when I listen to you, Phil, is, we, we need to get away from opinion, right? And saying, oh, in my experience and my cohort, it's this and this, and therefore it should be that and that. It has to be a more structured evidence generation, more following regulatory authorities, principles and guidances around this, I think, right? And I agree, it cannot be just a group of experts looking at it at face value and saying it shall be. We need, we need the, the tools of, complex data analysis to help us with that, those decisions. Thank you. Did you have anything to add, uh, Dr. Adam? No, no. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm still not seeing a lot of questions in the chat. So I have a question um, 
comment slash question question for myself with my HLA blinders on all the time, of course. Um, you know, you you talked about uh, fifty percent. This is to in the kidney presentation. Fifty percent of MVI injuries being DSA negative, and that you know perhaps there's other reasons for that outside of HLA donor specific antibody. Um, and you mentioned that there's you know maybe we're not detecting HLA DSA by standard methods. But I'm wondering if it came up in conversation that. And I say this with love for my HLA community, but maybe the HLA community has some work to do as far as how we report the results also. That, you know, if, if we're using a threshold that's like say 100,000 <laughs> MFI, that you have this like bulk of reactivity that's at like 900 MFI, that's all donor specific antibody and we're not reporting it. Or, you know, even if they're data from a decade ago where we still had these awesome single engine bead tools, but maybe we didn't look at them with the same through the same lens that we now do knowing more about them. So I'm wondering if that came up in conversation at all as well that you know just sort of the the DSA data themselves may have some you know some issues. Well as as you know and this is this is an, a process on its own under the star group right <laughs> there is a there's an army of people addressing that question how to report when to test how to test but many of the reagents used and published are not quality controlled in its production according to accreditation standards, right? And, and there is no, when we compare this to chemistry like a troponin, there has been no validation to that level of a troponin test or no International Standards Institute of all the reagents, especially for non-HLA antibodies, right? I, so it is, it's um, many, many reasons uh, why it DSA can be negative, right? And for me, I always blame Trish, which makes it easy, right? When there is a case where we have MVI and the DSA can be found, I said, Trish, you're just not trying hard enough. But but seriously, that that conversation is not is oversimplified in this summary, right? It's a very complex field in itself, and I know that the HLA community is working on it. Okay, thanks. I was just curious if it come up as part of the conversation. And I know it is a topic for the ASHI meeting, which is next week. So there'll be some more continuing conversations around that. But yeah, I think sometimes it's not the tool, but how we're using the tool. And non-HLA, yeah, is a whole separate thing. We have a lot of work to do there. But even for our HLA tools, I think. Um, Okay, oh, there's a, a, some comments here now in the chat. So uh, Dr. Corey says, an expression of gratitude for putting together such a comprehensive summary must have been a lot of work. He's very grateful. And um, uh, Renata uh, Ponsineras says um, she agrees that uh, DSA pre-transplant cutoff for unacceptable antibodies um, uh, used for, um, for, the tr for assessment of, of this information. So uh, thanks, thanks for those comments. Um, we're at the time now. I don't know if there's any other questions that people wanted to ask um, before we sign off. Um, not seeing more questions in the comments. You can email us, right? It is. It's. Uh, that's why I showed the table first. Mm -hmm. the, the remaining hundred slides were for the concerned citizen and the interested reader, right? So there, you can just take the table. That's enough. <laughs> yeah, it was an excellent, excellent overview. I agree. And I did put in the chat the um, a link to uh, the Martin Nason's paper that you referenced, if anyone wanted to pull that, because I thought it's such a great figure. Um, so that's in the chat also, if anyone wants it. And um, yeah, I just thank you again for such an incredible overview of such a giant topic. Okay, you're yeah. welcome. Thanks. Have a great. Oh, sorry. And before I'm falling, failing. Um, next week we have the ATI seminar where we're hosting Dr. Faisal Mahmood presenting on artificial intelligence-driven multimodal computational pathology. So, um, that uh, please uh, register and join us for that conversation. Um, and uh, and with that, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And have a great rest of your Wednesday. <laughs>